So, funny story. Um, usually I used to hate that when the pastor said that. Um, but I was all set to talk about God's love. I, I, last night I, I got the, the, the first draft done and was all set to go. I, I had our the good uh, the, um, sunrise service message, and it actually turned out to be a lot longer than the 10 minutes I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah, more or less about a half an hour, uh, and about 24 minutes and 56 seconds, I think it was. But who's counting? Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, you know, so I'm going to talk about love because this is a, today is the ultimate thing of God's love. Well, as God sometimes does, does? As God sometimes will do, uh, at 322, he gave me a new sermon to, to do. And I, I was panicking because um, it usually takes days to put something together. And so if there are rough patches here, just go with it. Just nod your head. Oh, that's a good point. I see where you're going. So, but today's message is called, Why Weren't They Waiting? You know, we remember Jesus didn't make any secret that he was going to Jerusalem to die. But every time he mentions him going to be put to death by the rulers of, of Jerusalem, he always, always said, but three days later, I will rise again. So the question is, why weren't his followers waiting? Wouldn't you think they would set up a camp outside of the grave and said, he said three days, let's go. Well, it looked like a, it would be like a little hourglass. Um, the Flintstone method. Um, remember how it started. Because it wasn't just like he wasn't going to say, well, I'm going to die tomorrow and come back three days later. No, there was a lead up to it. There was certain things, certain metrics that had to be met in order for, for this to begin. So let's start off by talk, flipping over to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. And we'll start in verse 15. It's a common passage we've been looking at quite a bit because <clears throat> it's important. Jesus after tell I, Excuse me. You can tell it's springtime. Uh, Jesus, after asking his disciples who the people say he was, and they got a whole range of answers from John the Baptist to Ezekiel to Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. He says, but okay, basically, that's not important. Who do you say that I am? And picking up in verse 15, he said to him, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the kings of, keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. After crediting his father for leading Peter's answer, he didn't say, good boy, Peter, you, you came up with that all yourself. No, it was from God. And now Jesus' ministry makes a turn. In verse 21, And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third day he be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you do, are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I think that sums up a lot of what their problem was. Jesus would predict his death at least three times in the Synoptic Gospels, and John would offer it even more. We have to remember that his death was the ultimate fulfillment of his earthly ministry. And while the disciples were clearly shaken by this declaration, like many things, it only bothered them when they thought about it. 
And they didn't really think about it all that much. So again, if Jesus told his disciples that this was going to happen, why weren't they waiting for him at the tomb? Or at least in proximity to it? Why did, was it that only the women came looking for him? And let's be honest, they didn't come looking for him to, because they thought he'd be alive. They came looking for his body so they could prepare it for burial. They expected to find his body so that they could put different herbs and spices on it because that's how it covered up the smell of decay. Let's flip over to Luke 24. Luke 24, not John, Luke. <sighs> okay, Luke 24, verses 5 to 7. Remember, they came to it, they saw that the, the, the stone had been rolled away, and they looked inside, and they saw something. Luke 24, and we'll start in verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their heads to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, Rise. I love that line. Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's almost like, you know, you meet someone as someone looking for someone that, you know, had been buried there years ago. Well, why are you looking here? Oh, because they're dead. That's where you look for dead people. But that's not where you're supposed to look for living people. The angel goes on to say, remember, guys, remember, he, he told you. So he didn't just tell those 12. He told these women as well. He was going to be turned over to sinful man, be killed, and rise on the third day. And it shouldn't have been a surprise to them. In Mark's account, we read a little bit more. Let's flip over to Mark 16. Off to the left one book. Mark 16, verses 6 to 9. Again, he's talking about the angel. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you in Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Again, remember, they singled Peter out because God knew Peter was probably going through a lot of stuff at this point. He had denied his Lord three times, and it wasn't like he denied him and Jesus was somewhere locked in a cell. He denied him in front of Jesus. And so he says, the angel says, make sure you tell Peter too. He's still part of the group. There's no lingering doubts. Again, why weren't they waiting? Well, that's what we're going to look at. All that Jesus said didn't line up with what they had been taught. The way Jesus lived his life was not the way the Messiah was supposed to be. Remember the idea, the reason Peter rebuked him about this idea that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to die? You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. How can you die? And I bet when Jesus said, I'm going to die, or go to Jerusalem, be turned over and die, or be killed, I bet as soon as he said, and I'm going to rise again, all they heard was, shh. Because that didn't make any sense to them. And their brain just kind of blocked it out, filtered it out. Remember, Jewish men at that time were taught up to age 13. The Messiah was the guy that's going to restore Israel. They were looking at passages in the Bible, and they were, let's be honest, they were cherry-picking what they wanted to read. Let's go to Isaiah 9. And yes, at, at Resurrection Sunday, you do flip. Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verses 5 to 7. Here's what they were looking at. You know, that's, this is what their vision of the Messiah was. Uh, should we start? The, uh, let's start in verse 2. 
He says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest and as glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken it as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, torment, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace that there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. They were thinking, this is who Messiah is. You know, I wonder if anyone pulled out a, a pocket scroll and said, Jesus, maybe you need to read up on your qualifications. Or maybe, <coughs> excuse me, they were looking at Daniel or thinking on Daniel. Flip over to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Daniel 7, right after Ezekiel. Daniel 7. And we'll look at verses 13 and 14. Daniel's vision. It was, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. So, make sure you remember this. Whenever you see, because one of the things people will say is Jesus never said he was the Messiah. And they'll discount John because they'll say, well, John was written way after, and it wasn't, but it was the last one to be written. And they'll say he never said it. But if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he often refers to himself as the Son of Man. And it's from here. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion, dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So that's what they're looking at. And, and in fact, they even go further. They say, Remember what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. The, the Messiah was supposed to be like Moses. Moses led them out of, out of a slavery. And again, it's all true. Jesus is all these things. You know, Jesus did lead them out of slavery, slavery to sin. And he is coming back, and he will, all those other prophecies will be fulfilled. It just wasn't this time. These are all about the conquering Messiah, the Son of Man. He was going to drive out all of Israel's enemies, and at the time they were like, start with Rome, get rid of Rome. He was going to restore David's kingdom. That's what they believed Messiah was going to do, and they were taught it over and over again, even from an early age. Nowhere in those passages does it say the Messiah is going to die. Literally, that made no sense to them. How could Messiah die? And clearly, as soon as he said it, they stopped listening to those parts. So every time Jesus mentioned Messiah, the disciples had one point of view and one image of Messiah, but Jesus was talking about himself, and he had God's point of view of what Messiah is. And they didn't, they didn't mesh. And so whenever those didn't mesh, the disciples just either didn't listen or ignored. You know, I'm sure we've all done that in the past. You're sitting in school and you're like, eh, okay, I know this. You know, but again, it was filtered. And so when Jesus said Messiah was going to die, they did what their religious had done in the past. They stopped listening and looked to explain it away. It would go something like this. The Son of Man is going to di And it would be nothing. They'd be just like, oh, okay, well move on. Not only were they filtering out Jesus' death and resurrection, but they also filtered out other things that you would think were important. How about his betrayal? Remember when he instituted, we read from Luke about the Lord's table. And 
Remember what he said in verse 21 of Luke 22. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man does it as has been determined, but woe to the man that whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them could be the one who is going to do this. Jesus gives them the table to remember him. And behold, lo and behold, the hand of the betrayer is on the table with him. And Jesus says, hey, by the way, the betrayer's hand is on the same table as me. Now, you know, I'm sure everyone went, what? You know, because, but it grabbed their attention for a moment. But look at the very next set of verses. You know, he's talking about betrayal. They seem to be upset, but we'll flip over to Luke 22. Luke 22. Starting in verse 24. Right after that passage, it says, A dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Okay, someone's going to betray you. Is it you? Is it? No, no. Okay, okay. Oh, by the way, who's the greatest? In verse 25, and he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. And who is greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Again, after seeking, getting a little bit worked up about the betrayer, they jump right to this uh, oldie but a goodie. Who's the greatest? And remember, we'll know, we know it when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration where they saw Moses and Ezekiel and Jesus all together. Where they heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son. They come down the hill and remember they were embarrassed because they were still complaining, talking about, well, who's the greatest? You know, that was something that's really big on their minds because they thought, remember John and James got their mom to come along and say, you know, will you promise my mom, my, me one thing? And Jesus like, well, what is it? And, Could you my son be on one side while you set up your kingdom? And, and again, thinking the world. This is how it's going to be. So we need kings. So you're going to be the Messiah. You're going to be the king. Could my son sit on either side of you? You know, again, they weren't thinking properly. They were much of the world. Their eyes were set on the things of this world, and it wasn't going to be removed. Jesus had to use uh, illustrations to correct their errant th thinking about what a great leader was among the people. He would wash their feet. He would take took the time at Passover, that last uh, meal. He took that time and he washed the disciples' feet. If you want to read it, it's in John 13, verses 1 to 17. But he says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to be a servant. And it's true. There's a lot of people who want to serve God, but they only want to serve Him as a trusted advisor. Serving God means getting your hands dirty. It means working and breaking a sweat. And they should have known this. And as far as the betrayer goes, I don't know why they didn't pick up and stick to that, because that's actually in the Old Testament. In, in Psalm 41, verses 8 to 10, the psalmist writes, they say a deadly thing is poured out on me. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up and I may repay them. Again, even the amount that he was betrayed for was turned over to him. In Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13, it says, then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. When Judas betrayed Jesus, that was the arranged for price. When Judas committed suicide because he was heartbroken or he regretted his decision and what to do, 
He came and literally threw those 30 pieces of silver into the temple. And guess what? He can't use blood money as an offering to the Lord. So what did they do? They went out and brought a potter's field. Does anyone know what a potter's field is? Tim? Okay, you're getting a little ahead, but yes, a potter's field is the field usually behind a potter's house. And what the potter would do is when he would fire his pots, if they didn't come out right, if they broke, he would just throw them behind his house, which made the ground out there very good for nothing. You couldn't plant plants back there, so it would become a potter's field where people would be buried. Um, and... So Judas's betrayal money became a potter's field for people who were visiting Jerusalem or who couldn't afford a spot in the, in the, in the cemetery. Um, so, again, this should have been a sign. And this happened before Jesus rose again. You know, so they should have said, wait a minute, when, what's this happening? You see... They only picked and chose the, the prophecies that they liked. There were other prophecies, like he wasn't going to stay dead. In Psalm 1610, for you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, that's hell, or let your, your Holy One see corruption. But no one was waiting. Jesus came to fulfill those other prophecies that, he, that the Jews glossed over. Psalm 22 Lots of information about the Messiah and the way he'd be treated. But I picked out 16 to 18. He says, For the dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and my clothing. They cast lots. Remember what they did with Jesus' clothing. This is in the Psalms. They would have known this. Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has the light shone. Oh, we can go to Isaiah 53. Oh, why don't we? Back to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Another messianic passage that they decided to skip over. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before us like a young plant, and like a root of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we desire him. Whenever you see a picture of Jesus, doesn't he have, he has those long flowing locks, he's, you know, he looks, got that, got that nice trim beard, mustache. I mean, he looks, he's a very attractive guy, and, and what the Bible says, he, he looked just like everyone else. So unless all of Israel is full of very handsome guys, you know, it, it isn't. But then it keeps going. In verse 3, he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to slaughter and like a sheep that was before his shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. 
yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Please understand, this is who Jesus is. This is the Messiah he came to be. But as, as, as it was, no one connected all these dots. The disciples were lost in grief. That even when they heard the news of the empty grave, it didn't cause them to react in hope. Luke 24. Yep, go back to Luke 24. Sooner or later, you're all going to beat Cat up and tell her to give you bookmarks. Luke 24. Oh, then we'll cut up sheets of paper. <laughs> Luke 24 is starting in verse 13. Okay, so let me set the stage. Jesus has been in the ground. Two disciples are going home. That's what we see here. That very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were walking with each other about all they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to him, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these early things have happened. Okay, so here we see a very personal account of how at least two of the disciples were. Two disciples who were chosen this time to leave Jerusalem. They were sad at the loss of Jesus. And they tell Jesus, who they're prevented from recognizing, what they believed and what happened. And that all these things took place just three days ago. Remember what Jesus kept saying to them. Three days later, and I will rise again. No, three days ago he left. and you know. But they go on. It's like you could just see. Verse 22 uh, to 24, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman said, but him they did not see. You know, you could almost see Jesus just put his head to his hand. Let me get this straight. Jesus, the, some women that you know went to the tomb. They couldn't find a body, but angels of God said that he was alive. The empty tomb was then verified by some of your own men, and you thought this was a great time to leave Jerusalem. Jesus says essentially that, and doesn't just tell them, but now he takes them back to scriptures. Verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but he urged them to strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up scriptures? And then they run back to Jerusalem to tell what happened. Jesus didn't say, Well, here's some secret scriptures that you guys don't know about. It was stuff that they knew, that they had heard, but that made no sense. 
Jesus came to do something that they didn't think they needed. They didn't really believe they needed to deal with sin because they had the sacrifices. And I'll say again, how could they not have known? Why didn't they listen? But we have to be careful that we don't make the same mistake ourselves. Why aren't we waiting with anticipation of the fulfillment of those promises? Like, he's coming back. Remember, he told his disciples, John 14, 3, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you might be saying, well, I'm waiting. Remember, waiting does not mean inaction. Why aren't we looking at the times and comparing them to what Jesus said? Let's go to Matthew 24, off to the left, two books, if you're in Luke. Matthew 24. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, starting in verse 3, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when all these things will, when will all these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. They will lead many astray. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For well, this must take place, but the end is not yet. Just hearing about wars and rumors of wars, that's, that's not the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Drop down to verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation such that has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if the days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. For the sake of the elect, those days have been cut short. Please understand, Jesus is saying, you haven't seen bad days yet. You haven't even come close. You know, sometimes people want to say, oh, you know, this is so bad out there. No, it's going to get worse. In fact, Jesus said if it wasn't cut short, no one would survive. Verse 23, Then if someone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if, you say, if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Notice that the Antichrist and the false prophets are going to be able to do miracles. And there's some people who are going to cling to him and like, he must be from God. Look at that amazing miracles he's done. You know, maybe he's turning water into wine, turns the Hudson into blood, whatever. Don't believe them. Your faith is not based on miracles that happen. It's based on faith in Christ Jesus. And he's warning us. And these miracles said, they could lead astray, if possible, even the elect. That's how mighty these miracles are going to be. Verse 27, he says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then Jesus will return, and there'll be no mistaking about it. Verse 30, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the another. 
from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus says, look, look at the fig tree. You know it's summer when it starts to burst uh, leaves forth. And we have a little baby fig tree out there. And you can tell around June 21st, it, it starts to send out leaves. Up to that point, it's pretty dead. Um, Jesus gives the example of when God's judgment uh, came previously. He says, it's going to be the same way. Verse 37, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. People will be pointing to false Christs. They will also be pointing to people sowing doubts that Jesus will ever return. They'll say, well, he hasn't returned yet, so why are you waiting? 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 4. Knowing this, first of all, Peter writes, that scoffers will come in the last days, and scoffing, because that's what scoffers do, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning. But the end is still going to come, regardless of what people say. In 2 Peter 3.10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will all be exposed. It will come suddenly. It will come unexpectedly. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 and 3 says, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Remember, labor pains, I'm told, you know, I've never suffered labor pains. I am told it can be kind of hard and hurtful. And they get harder and faster, closer together as it gets close to time to delivery, as I've been told. Um, I wonder what it'd be like if men got pregnant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd be on bed rest the whole time. So, <laughs> so no, but so that's how these things are going to happen. They're going to come in clusters of death and destruction and disaster, and they're going to happen more and more frequently. We may be at the very beginning. Book of Acts says that we're already living. The last days happened, started when um, Jesus rose and ascended into heaven. It will not be a pleasant time. Not just because of disaster, but as 2 Timothy 3, oh, we can go to it. We haven't done Timothy yet. Go over 2 Timothy. <laughs> right after 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3. Paul's writing a warning to the people, to, to his protege, Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. He says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self control, brutal not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. That last part, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. How many times have you... We need more people in a church, we need more pastors, so we can do more things. As I've said many times, this church as small as it is, can do anything a mega church can do as long as they do it in the will of God. Because God is a majority, and He's all-powerful, and He can do all things. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we've got to stop looking with our eyes. But 
They have a form of godliness and they deny its power. A mega church has its power. And I'm not saying this for across the board. I'm not, please. But for many, it's just look at how great we are. Look how big we are. We can do so much more. But then where's God's part? Jesus gives an illustration, uh, jumping back to the, to the passage in, that we were looking at before. He says, uh, in a warning to us, he says, therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. You have to be ready. Just as the, the, the disciples should have set up camp outside the grave and just waited, you have to be ready. How do you be ready? You have to be in his word. You have to be proclaiming the gospel. What does the Great Commission say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the, he gives a par nice parable here in the last days. He says in verse 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household? to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing, so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him out over his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunk, drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect and at an hour that he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We have to be patient. We have to be doing what God wants us to do. James wrote in James 5, 7, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. The day is closer now than when Jesus spoke about it. It's closer now than when Peter wrote about it, than when John wrote about it. It's closer than it was last week at Palm Sunday, 2021. It's closer than it was Good Friday. It's closer now than it was when we saw this message. I know some of you think that that's an eternity. but So, if we really believe this is going to happen, really think, He's going to do what he says it to do. If we really believe this, why are we not expectantly living like little Christ out in the world and telling others? Why aren't we doing that today? Looking in the clouds, getting up every morning, praising God, I got another day to share the gospel. I, again, I go back to that country western song. Everyone wants to talk about heaven, but no one wants to go today. You know, I want Jesus to come. Well, I got loved ones. I, we don't have a say. You can't convert people. What churches are trying to do now is they're trying to convert people by saying, well, we'll take out some of the things that offend people. It's God's Word. You can't take His words away. You're just giving them a false sense of security. And so we have to look at God's Word. We have to share it. What is the great, let's go to Matthew 28, because that's the Great Commission. That's what every one of us should be doing at this time, starting in verse 18. And as if to illustrate the point that being a believer is, is more than just seeing miracles. In verse 16 of Matthew 28, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Remember, he's already risen. He's already shown himself. This is, this is getting near the end. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. What's the end of verse 17 say? But some doubted. He's raised from the dead. He's showing the holes. But some doubted. Unbelief is a choice. And you're either all in for God or you're not in at all. You can't say, I believe some of what Jesus says or some of what the Bible, that doesn't save you. In verse 18, Jesus came to him and said to him, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, so first off, you have to go. You can't just sit around and do nothing. You have to 
go. Uh, make disciples of all nations, so you can't say, well, I'm only going to save the people I like or the people of the same race. We're all one race with a human race. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. It doesn't save them. The, the, the churches that believe that are heretics. Teaching them, so you make disciples, followers of Jesus, you baptize them, so inward change, outward sign, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And if that's not enough, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have to remember that. We have to do what Jesus commanded us. And remember, brought it down, you know, because he knew that, you know, in 2021, actually probably knew it in 1 BC or 1 AD, that we, we would need help back then too. Two simple commandments. That's all. He, t- he said, forget all the, the Ten Commandments. Forget, you know, it's not as easy as don't eat of the tree because we'll never get back to there until we get to heaven. But two simple commandments with so much depth. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those things, he says, teach him all that I commanded you. That's all you have to do. And if you love God with everything you have, that means you're not going to sit there and go, well, he's running a little late today, Pat, God, you know. No, everything you have, that means all of your time. It used to be you could tell a person's spiritual health by looking at their checkbook. Today, I submit to you, you can look at it by looking at the checkbook, the schedule, and the internet browsing history. And maybe they're television watching history. That's where your heart is. Where is the majority of your time, money, and effort spent? Is it serving God or is it serving yourself? If it's serving yourself, you've got to change. Jesus could come any moment. And I've heard people say, well, I'll wait till the rapture happens and then I'll be all set. Then I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll know it's true and then everything will be fine. If you can't worship God completely when there's no tribulation, what makes you believe you'll do it when they say, oh, you worship God and we're going to kill you publicly and and, your kids will betray you. What makes you think you're going to be able to do that and stand up to it if you can't do it now? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for, for the example of those all too human disciples, Lord. Everyone... I can relate to. Lord, forgive us when we take for granted the time that you've allotted for us. Let us not continue to do it. You can come any moment, Lord. We we, we wait for that time to meet you in the air, to see our loved ones with you. Oh, Lord, let us just praise you, oh God. Let us praise you for your deliverance. We praise you for Jesus' first coming, Lord, for his death and resurrection that allowed us to go be with you for all eternity. And, and Lord, because of that, we look forward to the second coming where we can actually go and spend eternity with you. Lord, let us live our lives now with a sense of urgency, with that idea that you can come any time Let us share because we're living in a world that's going to burn. And Lord, if we were in a house or apartment building that was on fire, we wouldn't pick and choose or stop at the apartments that we felt called to uh, warn them about the fire. We would yell and scream and bang on doors. Lord, this world's going to end. Let us start banging in, in doors and letting people know what it means to be a Christian. And not just with our words, Lord, let our lives line up with what a Christian is, a little Christ, so that there's something different about us, that we're not just hypocrites. Lord, be with us this week. Open our eyes to opportunities, and Lord, yes, please come, Lord. Please come. In your name, amen. And our closing hymn is uh, 367.